Live from Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Google Cloud Next 17. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Palo Alto for two days of coverage of Google Next 2017, it's special coverage uh, brought to you by Intel. I want to thank Intel for sponsoring our editorial coverage of Google Next. Obviously cloud service providers is a huge opportunity. Cloud is changing the digital transformation and I want to thank Intel for that. Breaking down the coverage, going into the realities of cloud, our next guest is Pedro Abrari, who's with Pramada, Chief Technology Officer. You guys do a customer digita digitation of cloud platform. Uh, based in Silicon Valley, you're a veteran, former entrepreneur. Um, welcome to theCUBE coverage of Google Next. Thank you, John. So first, tell us about what you guys do as a company. And I know you guys have an uh, interesting story because you're in the, the heart and of the cloud game relative to operationalizing it. And it's, yep. it's complicated in being an enterprise cloud solution. There's nuances there. There's some tripwires, there's some landmines, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. What do you guys do? Let's do, do a quick background. So uh, what Pramada does is we are a B2B platform for large enterprises such as NCR, HPE, CenturyLink, who have hundreds of, you know, in some cases, thousands of customer contracts and don't have a handle on their contracts. We digitize those contracts and those customer relationships and we layer intelligence on top to allow key decision makers in, the, in those businesses to have a single uh, unified and up-to-date view of the state of each customer relationship at any point in time, you know, layering on top billing data and CRM data and MTM data. And what's interesting, what I, why I like that you're here is that it really hits the, the, the theme of Google Next, which mm -hmm. is you know, data, data sets, machine learning, AI, pointing to a new model of how software's changing applications, right? Mm -hmm. And so you guys are at the middle of this digital transformation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's a whole new paradigm. It's not like the classic you know, linear thinking of supply chain or CRM kind of thinking. You guys are truly data driven and, and this teases out the complexities. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's your thoughts? Because again, Google is clearly going down to the enterprise level, mm -hmm. as is Amazon, a little bit ahead of them uh, in terms of progress. But this is the, the trick everyone is doing in the digital transformation. I want to leverage my data. I want to move to a cost-effective infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, or it could be a startup saying, hey, I want to get into the game and I want to innovate on a feature. And then there they are. They could be the next Snapchat out there watching. This is important, but it's also hard. What's your thoughts on, on, on the landscape of this opportunity? Uh, well, cloud computing definitely changed the game for high-tech startups uh, in, in a big way. You know, when infrastructure as a service first rolled out, you know, with AWS as kind of the tip of the spear, um, the virtualization of hardware was a big game changer because to, as a startup, to even get in the game, you had to have millions of dollars worth of investment in just hardware and software. Uh, and you know, every two or three years, you had to renew all your hardware and software because out of, they were out of date. So before you could even focus on your core competency, there was all these layers of investment and all the talent that you had to attract uh, just to deal with you know, getting a, a cloud off software up and running. Um, with, with cloud computing, uh, particularly with infrastructure as a service, it, it changed that game, virtualized hardware, and it al allowed a lot more companies to have access and the ability to get into the game that couldn't previously. But the story doesn't end there, that's just the beginning of the story, because to get a cloud software really up and running, uh, you still have to have a team. Uh, traditionally, it used to be IT teams, but you know, it's kind of the evolution has come now, we have DevOps teams, and for, for good reason, uh, who have to build a lot of additional plumbing on top of the infrastructure as a service until your cloud can be up and running in a scalable, cost-effective, you know, elastic fashion, if you will. Um, yeah. Talk about the scale piece, because this is interesting, because you have a lot of experience in scaling with the cloud. Mm -hmm. This is the main thing that people are leveraging with the cloud, is that I can scale up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Scale up and scale out. Um, and then complex, the complexity is the digitization piece, which is you know more specific to the enterprise. What are some of the challenges that you see with scale? Uh, because this is something that needs to be factored in on the design side. Mm -hmm. So digitize, oh yeah, I want to digitize my entire company. Uh, okay, sounds easy. Yeah. <laughs> but the scale piece is important because you now have scale stuff. Right. Uh, How does it all work? It, cloud software, you know, early on in, in, in the cloud days, you know, we had IT, uh, IT, IT teams and we had developers who were really enterprise, de enterprise developers. And they looked at the world with those, you know, glasses on. 
And very shortly thereafter, as soon as you know, the first cloud software was up and running, people realized, wait a minute, the old way of building software just doesn't work anymore. You have to rethink. This is where DevOps developed, where it was a culture of developers and operations all working in concert, always designing software for scale in the cloud. It's a very different, you know, very different paradigm. Um, and you know, things such as you know, transition from stateful services to stateless services to microservices, you know, it, it all continued to, to turn services into things that could run and spun up and run across a large cluster of servers, uh, as opposed to something that only scales vertically on a single box. But uh, if, you, if you think you, uh, you have a service that you can throw on the cloud and you can magically get the benefits of that and costs get lowered, uh, I'm here to tell you uh, that if you don't play your cards right, it blows up in your face very quickly. Give an example, because this is the trade-off, back to the trade-off conversation, right? Yeah, yeah, an example is if you, if you have software that doesn't scale horizontally, uh, that, that is not elastic, that doesn't scale, and it only scales vertically, and you throw it in the cloud, and the more load gets on that software and that service, the only way to go is to keep getting bigger and bigger boxes that are available on AWS or, or on Google or on Azure. Um, and the, the larger the box, the more expensive it becomes. The whole premise of cloud computing was you know, commodity boxes you know, and things that could scale you know, this way. Uh, and, and you really are basically going back to the same old problem you had on the, inter on the enterprise side, having to get bigger and bigger and bigger boxes. Um, that can really blow up in your face in terms of the cost that, you, that people would be shocked the kinds of bills that they can receive from some of the cloud vendors if they don't manage and contain uh, their, their problem effectively. We're here at Pedro Mabrari, who's with the CTO of Pramada. They bring up an interesting point. I want to jump and just kind of double down on that because the classic IT enterprise conversation in the, in the, in the heyday of enterprises that was developing was the shark fin, the tip of the iceberg. What you don't see under the water is the, the hidden costs, right? So oh, it's massive. <laughs> the total cost of ownership has, been, has always been a big issue. And if you look at things like OpenStack, for instance, great on paper, great philosophy, mm -hmm. but the total cost of ownership has really kind of crippled that from being, you know, other than anything more than infrastructure as a service. So there's trade-offs for an enterprise when they mm -hmm. look at the total cost of ownership, saying, oh, I'm just going to throw everything in the cloud and run multi-cloud and everything's <laughs> going to be managed perfectly and there's manageability and the security, I'm all set. No. No. Or is it that, no. I, mean, I so mean, first of all, wh why is that so important? Because there's some trade-offs specifically here. Um, there is, so first of all, multi-cloud, cloud neutrality, it, you know, is, in theory, it sounds great, but it comes at a very expensive price. Uh, you know, if, if I'm running on, on Google, or if I'm running on AWS, and if I commit to running only on AWS or on Google or on Azure, for that matter, I have the opportunity to leverage some of the managed, managed services that are offered up by the vendor, and they have the world's foremost experts at running some of these services. Let's say your software requires a relational database. Um, if you're going to be cloud neutral, you have to host that database, deal with backup recovery, scalability, failovers, all of that you know, overhead associated with it, which means you have to hire yeah. world's foremost experts at doing these things, and you have to attract them, you have to pay them, and, and, and on top of everything else that is associated with having to anticipate yeah. the, the heaviest load of your system and always you know, planning for that, if you can leverage you know, the, the Google Cloud SQL, or if you can leverage AWS RDS. But Google does not only runs MySQL, they don't run anything else. Uh, that's true, that's true, but uh, AWS does. Yeah. Uh, they have a plethora of different so databases. So it's good to go to AWS in that case. Uh, yeah. Well, if, if you're starting from ground up, uh, and, you, and, and you know, you're a startup, you know, committing to MySQL is just fine. Yeah. <laughs> if you, if you Which already Which is why Google's really doing well in the cloud native piece. Exactly, Not exactly. Enterprises who have other databases, other relational databases. Yeah, and so if you're, if you're, you already ha are sitting on top of a legacy that you have to support, then, you know, going to AWS might be easier. But AWS has its own complexities because it is a massive service, it's a massive, it has a lot of APIs, it has a lot of complexity, so you, you have to deal with all of that complexity. Even the billing side of AWS is, uh, it, you know, has a whole economy all to itself. There's all these vendors that exist just for managing AWS costs. So, you know, having a, a, a model like Google, which is yeah. just a lot more simplified and kind of reduces the, the, the explosion of complexity that you potentially deal with on the AWS side, uh, may work just well for a lot of startups. This is really uh, an important point, I think, because this is something that's not being covered much in the press or in the analyst community is, is that, um, Everyone certainly talks about lock-in. Oh, the Roach Motel, you can check in, but you can't check out. And I've heard that mm -hmm. 
been called to Amazon and everyone else, the lock-in. But if you look at what you're saying, is interesting. You say lock-in actually in, con in, in contrast to say the opportunity of leveraging, ma say, manageability mm -hmm. and security mm -hmm. is not a big deal given the fact that you don't want to have to build those services. If you go exactly to, hey, right. a fully neutral cloud where I'm going to have multiple workloads, then it's on me or an IT to build the software fabric for manageability. That's exactly right. So the risk is, if it's not available, <laughs> if there's no software that does that, that's the risk. That's what you. It is the at. risk, and you know, and as a as as a serial entrepreneur has done, who has done numerous startups, one of the key aspects of doing a startup is focusing on your core IP and your core differentiation. Your core IP is not how to run a cloud software; it's other people's IP, and you should leverage that. Platform as a service is a way to leverage that, and you give up some control. You fall into a platform as a service, and for that matter, you know, if you if you want to fall into a platform as a service, you can fall into a platform as a service. Uh, on AWS, or you can do it you know, with the Google App Engine, or you can do it on Azure, but you can basically see yeah. which one fits your needs and your profile and your software best, and just give up control for productivity and for cost reductions, and also you get yeah. gain from all the, the expertise and best practices they have developed around security and audit and you know, all the yeah. uh, you know, ramifications around uh, you know, basically making sure that you, t you take care of your customer data safely and securely and you don't yeah. expose them to risk. And this is interesting because it makes the cloud argument more about the beauties in the eye of the beholder, whatever the enterprise thinks is best. Mm -hmm. Whether it's cloud native, that might be Google. But then it's an opportunity for the vendors to differentiate mm -hmm. on some certain services. So I, I get that, but the question I want to ask you is for the folks watching who are in the enterprise trying to squint through all the complexities. Hey, I'm on a digital transformation. I don't know what's what. I'm seeing Google say this, Amazon says this, it's apples to oranges. You know, my, I like, what's in it for me, right? <laughs> I have my own enterprise. So that's an interesting conversation. So the question is what, would you advise enterprises um, to evaluate when to go with Google, when to go with AWS, when to go with Oracle or IBM? There's a variety of different choices. When do you evaluate that trade-off factor of uh, what to leverage? How do you how do you it, advise that? It's a it's a tough nut to crack. Uh, you know, you, you, before you even move to the cloud, you can still do some soul searching internally and look and look at the good, bad, or ugly of your own software. Uh, you know, what are strengths, what are scalability issues, you know, can it scale horizontally, can it only scale vertically? And with that in mind, then you go and evaluate the options that are available out there. Uh, you know, if, if you are never going to leverage any of the native cloud services that are offered up by AWS or, or, or Google or, or Azure, and you only want to, let's say you want to be com completely dockerized and containerized, and you really want to kind of follow that model, uh, maybe these services don't matter to you. Uh, and you're willing to take on all of that responsibility and, and manage all those services. Uh, so, so you really have to, and I would strongly advise that you gain uh, you know, and go to, to cloud experts who have done it mm -hmm. before time and again and seek their insights and, and advice and not jump into the deep end of the pool thinking that, oh, it's just cloud, I, you know, anybody can do it. Question for you on, on say Google, for instance, say that you, you and I were called into the Diane Green's office and they said, hey, Pedro and John, I want you to advise me. We really have good dev developer empathy. We talked about this in our last segment, mm -hmm. developer empathy. Uh, but we don't have a lot of um, empathy for enterprises. Mm -hmm. You guys are expert in the enterprise. What should we do to empathize with the enterprise better? What would we advise them? What would, you, what would we uh, go in and say to her and her team? I, I would say start with the pain points of the enterprise, right? Uh, you know, if, before the enterprise even consider moving to the cloud, their biggest and primary concern is security. Uh, you know, they, they have to make sure that, that they can trust you. And of course, that has really, over the years, have, has been chipped away at. The, the old obstacles are, are, are falling one at a time. But really being able to speak their language and get them to be comfortable that they are in, in a following best practices in a very solid and secure environment. Um, and, and on top of that, you know, help them with all, all their audit needs. You know, everybody wants to get certified. And, and a lot of that, when you actually move to the cloud, uh, if you have a Google or AWS on a checkbox, a lot of those questions that auditors ask go right out the window. So that is a helpful factor. But helping them along those lines and, and also cost factor, a lot of people don't know what it's going to cost. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, cost calculators and all that stuff are, are good and great, but they only go so far because there's a lot of hidden costs that you don't, you don't associate with it. A lot of it can right. come in the form of talent and expertise. A lot of it comes in the form of just, you know, paying for services. Yeah. Um, the SLA too. I mean, SLA. Right. SLA is a huge one. I would say to Diane, look at, you know, 
being a price leader, and you certainly you guys have great pricing, but I don't think the enterprise is price sensitive. I think they're SLA sensitive. They are, right. And that's kind of their weak spot a little bit here. It, it is. And of course, you know, now now Google has <laughs> a little bit of an advantage to kind of something to, to kind of bring to the table yeah. with, with what happened to AWS last week. Yeah. But again, if you take the big picture of the SLAs that are, that are offered up by any of these cloud platforms, compared to what you could do internally, hosting your own services with your own IT team, I'll bet you they'll beat your IT team every day of the week, twice on Sunday, yeah. in terms of SLA. Uh, so, so I wouldn't be afraid of moving to mm -hmm. the cloud. Uh, and you know, and again, things yeah. hiccups happen to anybody and everybody. Uh, but well, I mean, uh, you know, Pedro, one of the things we was, we saw clearly this year at AWS, we've been, we've we've done all the live broadcast AWS for years, and but this year what was clear is is that the speed of which Amazon has been innovating services and Google needs to match this cadence as well on their side for their architecture is one of those cases where they're doing it faster than the IT guys could do it. So it's the same argument that open source is a great value because open source is moving the needle mm -hmm. faster than mm -hmm. homegrown teams could do on IT. So that's an opportunity to leverage that to focus on the core competency of the enterprise. Absolutely, and then one of the other things that people overlook, when you, when you leverage an AWS RDS service, uh, what you gain is not just what they have at the time, what you also gain is all the improvements that happen over time on their behalf, on their side, where they keep increasing their throughput and performance and scalability. You know, RDS, you know, AWS just came out, you know, really with the, not just, but the Aurora service, which is effectively like a, you know, acts like an elastic relational database, which is a concept unheard of. Uh, you know, and, you know, and imagine trying to replicate that internally. I mean, it is, it is things that, you know, the, the level of expertise they bring to bear and the level of resources that they, they bring to bear to really solve these complex problems far outweigh anything that we would have in, you know, in our company to be able to ad address those very same challenges. Pedron, great to break down some of these trade-offs. This is, this is the, the nuances of the enterprise being empathetic is to really understand the buy-build kind of concept versus when do you want to leverage co your core competency, when do you want to shift that mm -hmm. capability to a cloud or certain clouds, certainly the criteria. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. Well, take us a little, take a minute to, to, to talk about your company. Mm -hmm. What are you guys doing? Because you guys are in the middle of digitization, we digital are. transformation, <laughs> um, and it's not that easy. No. What are you guys doing for customers and what's your competitive advantage? So what we do is, you know, we have a lot of large enterprise customers who typically have hundreds of thousands of customer contracts that nobody ever looks at or reads or, you know, or you only really need an army of lawyers to really comprehend and understand. And, and this is an obstacle to making good business decisions to grow your, your company. So well, large enterprises, much like in small enterprises, need a up-to-date view of their customer relationships, which starts with the customer contract, which is where we come in and we digitize the, the customer contract and we extract key information out of it. The information, not, not all the legalese and noise, but really- But the, the core key, data. The core data, the core key decision-making data that you need to have to, to, to interface with the customer. We extract that out and make it available to you in, a, in a, an environment that is accessible by anybody, not just lawyers. Uh, on top of that, we bring in data from across your enterprise about that customer, you know, whether it's your billing systems or CRM systems or MDM systems, you name it, we, we can bring that, all of that data layered on top of your contract data, and on top of that, introduce additional layers of intelligence yeah. where it tells you what is the most up-to-date aspect of your customer relationship information, and that allows you to make you know, real-time important decisions that you know over time your finance Listen, teams and sales ops teams can really this maximize. This is classic data driven, where you're taking core data about the customer and contract they pay for stuff. They have you know, some key data in their system of record, if you will, mm -hmm. and kind of sharing it into other systems. Sounds like it's perfectly poised for machine learning and AI. Is that well, what that is our secret? That's that is our secret sauce. Uh, okay. You know, trying to you know trying to ingest and and digitize hundreds of thousands of contracts. Uh, cannot just be done manually. <laughs> clearly, it's not just a sales thing for uh, the renewal. It's more of exactly. the operational. Impact. Renewals is a big issue. There's there's massive operational impact. There's upsell impact. There, there's a lot of yeah. you know our customers yeah. gain after you know adopting us you know millions of dollars in lost revenue potential where they yeah. are thrilled to tell us about it. And like, we have found all this money we didn't know we had. It's kind of like having uh, on top uh, knowledge base and data in big data. You, everybody knows there's information there that we could yeah. use, but to tap it, you go to machine learning. Cross-pollinating core data and making it uh, addressable for other apps. 
precisely right. Yeah. Okay, Pedro, thanks so much for coming and sharing your perspective. Breaking down the two days of special coverage of Google Next. This is the Cube live in Palo Alto. We've got folks on the ground, our reporters, our analysts, they'll be calling in. And of course, we've got an exclusive scoop with SAP. We have their, one of their top executives who runs the Palo Alto entire facility. Uh, all the folks came in from Germany. We had a chance to sit down with, with SAP. That's coming up uh, shortly. Stay tuned for more coverage live in Palo Alto for Google Next 2017 in our studio. We'll be right back with more after this short break.